it causes issues. Yeah, so yeah, it just... it, it's like I've got I've got pro audio equipment, but Skype doesn't play with that. So <laughs> then it becomes, you know, it, it's it's like well, we can have Skype or we can have two people in the room that sound really good. But since he's <laughs> in L.A. and I'm in Raleigh, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. But anyway, I think we're good. So um, we're gonna have to roll with it. And the people okay, in the chat just... room, if I, if we're both too low, at least we're equally low. The recording is gonna be good. And they can just turn yeah, it hope, up. <laughs> I hope you can hear us now, folks. All right, let's get this party started. This is where the actual podcast will be. <laughs> this has just been like primer. Um, here we go. Welcome, everyone, to the Space Game Junkie Podcast. I, as always, am your co-host, Brian. And joining me, as always, is your co-host, Jim. Uh, Black Jim Geary, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a little... Uh, change of pace this week usually we talk to game developers people who are making a game or selling a game or something we're we're, we're we're changing tack a little bit this week if i can use a naval term uh we're talking to author john henry did i say that right so we're yeah. live right now okay. so who goes by the pen name no jack Yaki. campbell author of the lost fleet series and if you guys have around the lost fleet series this is the series I like to kind of like in it and think of it as kind of like futuristic Horatio Hornblower a little bit. Uh, a little I hope bit. I, I hope you take that as a compliment because I love Horatio Hornblower. <laughs> yes. um, so it's kind of like that. Uh, basically, it revolves around this character named uh, Jack Geary, uh, who's known as Black Jack Geary, who was in hibernetic sleep for a hundred years while this horrible war between these two human factions went on around him, basically. And he was thawed out just when the, when, um, the, what's the name of the faction he's in? The Alliance. The Alliance. I thought it was the Alliance. I read all six books. I just, I'm, I'm fuzzy right now. Um, they, they find his escape pod a hundred years later, but because of, uh, attrition, the uh, skill the skill set and the education of the naval officers has gone basically in the toilet and he kind of has to retrain his fleet because he ends up being the commander through this long slog back to safe uh, to safe space and Jim was the one I mean I started I actually read the first book several years ago and then got distracted I think I read the first book and then lost my job, and then I couldn't buy any more books for a while. And so they kind of got pushed aside. You know, that happens. And then, uh, Jim, you were talking about your wife started reading them. Yeah, we were we were on a road trip to Ohio, and I got the audio book of the first one. And we listened to that on the, on the trip up and back. And then as soon as we got home, she was like, I must have the other, how many are there? <laughs> and, you know, so, so she, she pretty much, uh, like, chain read the entire series end to end. Yeah. And, and since she was doing it on audiobook, you know, if, if she was in the room with me, I picked that up. I, I got through the first two and a half, actually, you know, like in my commute and, and listening to that. And then I've, I've picked up the rest of the, of the story through talking to her. Um, you know, but it's, uh, she and I actually, we, we've had some kind of long conversations about that. And she, she really, uh, liked, I, I asked her to come on the show, but she's a little bit microphone shy. Um, but she, she really liked the, the physics of the space combat because it was not a Star Trek slash Star Wars. It's a little bit closer to, to hard sci-fi, uh, although it makes some concessions to, to good storytelling. Um, but also a, another thing that she pointed out was that uh, John, for for being a man, does not write women in a condescending way, or or in a ditzy way, or or whatever. So so she was like, well, the women in the book are are uh, perhaps not wise because nobody is really wise anymore because of the attrition rate of the war. But as far as people, they're intelligent people that they've gotten into places of power. They, they haven't slept their way into those positions. They actually, you know, earned it. They're competent leaders and, and that. So, you know, be, because I asked her, I was like, well, you know, we're, did you find anything off-putting at all in the portrayal of women? And she's completely satisfied with that. So I just thought I'd put oh, that good. out That's there. That's good to hear. Now, you actually do have a military background, 
if I read correctly. Yes, yes, I do. I'm a retired Navy officer. So. Oh, and how did that, how did that translate? Like, how did you go from in the Navy and then retired to writing a sci-fi book series? Like, what was the the chain of events or chain of thought that made that happen? Well, I, uh, I guess like most people who write, I'd always wanted to write. Uh, kind of put that on hold during the years I was in the Navy, but mm -hmm. I was picking up all kinds of experiences that would contribute to it. Uh, I mean, I was a ship driver, did amphibious stuff, uh, lots of different things. You know, went lots of places, learned about engineering and how systems work in the real world, and met lots of different from lots of places, um, different specialists, you know, learned how Marines think and talk as opposed to the way engineers think and talk as opposed to the way pilots think and talk. Uh, they're, they're all very distinct uh, communities. Uh, and so when the time came to uh, retire, the, the Cold War was winding down. They didn't need us anymore. Hmm. Uh, so a lot of us were asked to uh, um, depart as soon as possible. Um, I decided to give it a shot, and my wife strongly encouraged me to give it a shot. She said, if you don't try it, you'll always wonder if you could. And so that's how I, I wandered into it. Uh, started out doing um, both fantasy and science fiction, but most of what I've ended up writing was some form of science fiction or another. Right. So why the choice to publish under a pen name? Well, that was actually uh, not entirely a choice. Uh, my first two series that came out, there was the Stark's War series and then the Sinclair Jag in Space series. Uh, Stark's War sold moderately well. Um, the Jag in Space series was not too well marketed. As a matter of fact, the publisher sent it out initially with a, a uh, the first book in the series with a advertising line of a book about universal law. And... Uh, not surprisingly, not too many people bought it, and um, as a result, the series, um, because of the way the software and the major book chains, back then still Borders and Barnes and Noble ordered books, uh, they got me into a death spiral where they would order fewer copies of each subsequent one, which meant less chance it would be noticed and picked up. Oh. So by the time the uh, last book in the Jag and Space series came out. Uh, I was at the point where the major book chains wouldn't order uh, my books. Oh, no. So uh, my agent and my editor at the publisher both said, you need a new name. Because if you come in with a new name, the software says, hey, it's a new person. And then it orders more books. So huh. I picked uh, the Jack Campbell name to do a reset. And, you know, a, a lot of people have done that. Uh, you know, Megan Lindholm, Robin Hobb, she's done it. Um, it's a... Uh, been required because of the, the nature of the marketplace these days. And now Jack Campbell has sold lots more books than John Henry did, so <laughs> writing-wise, I'm Jack Campbell for the foreseeable future. <laughs> That's crazy. So so whenever, you're, whenever you want to launch into being a writer, um, do you just sit down and start writing something and then worry about trying to find an agent and a publisher later? Or do you seek out an agent and say, "Hey, I'm I'm starting to write something," but you know, and and uh, l let's say, you know, how how much of a book do you need done before you say, "Okay, now I've I've written a bunch of this, but I need money to live on." You know, can is anybody willing to bite on this? Maybe give me an advance or anything, or do you have to be well, established before you can have that conversation? Yeah, you, but before you can sell something you haven't written, you definitely have to be established. Uh, advice that just about every writer I know gives is that don't quit your day job if you mm -hmm. want to write. You wait until until maybe you get lucky enough to earn enough as a writer to do that. Until then, you keep your day job uh, because um, you know if you're mid-list or even a little below that, the vast majority of writers, you know, you're not making a lot of money. You're doing it more for the love of the thing uh, than otherwise. Uh, if you want to get in, you definitely have a have to have a product to show, hmm. uh, a story that shows you know how to write, you know how to make good characters, and you have interesting ideas. Uh, all those things are important. Uh, if you do that, then 
it's hard to get agents these days. Uh, it's actually much easier to try to make some sales. And that's, if you're writing short fiction, that's easier now than it ever was when I came in because now you've got all the online markets. Because hmm. um, growing up, I read, a, I read a lot of like Asimov magazine, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of the compilations of short science fiction, you know, where, where you get somebody's ideas and get an idea where they're going, but you know, and you, but you don't have to bite off like, you know, a two thousand page tome of a, of a thing. You know, well, it, 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 yeah. I uh, I started out writing mostly short fiction, and I think that's a good thing to do if you're starting out as a writer, because it gets you room to play around. You can start something if it doesn't work. You can abandon it, which you wouldn't if you'd already spent you know five hundred pages working on a novel, hmm. uh, and but doing the short fiction, it teaches you how to do things economically, how to write well. It gives you experience with a lot of different ideas and different concepts. You can play around a lot more. Hmm. Has so the... I, I do recommend that people start out by writing short fiction if that's something they can do. Now, has the Internet greatly changed the environment for that? Because it's much easier to get an audience and to, to get out. You know, because it's not like, well, you have to get published in Asimov or something or Omni or right. whatever existed back then. However, uh, there there is such a wide playing field, I would think that it's tough to get eyes on your product. Yeah, then. that's that's the, the, the contradiction. On the one hand, it is much easier to get yourself out there. When I started it, there was no market to speak of. You had Asimov's, Analog, Fantasy and Science Fiction, and a couple of minor print magazines. Now, odds are, you can get yourself out there some way, even if all you do is, is post the story online yourself. But, as you say, the problem is getting noticed when there's so much else out there these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that is difficult, getting, uh, getting that word of mouth, getting people to notice um, luck plays a big part of it. I mean, luck plays a big part in success in writing, no matter how you're doing it. Uh, having just the right concept at the right time, having people notice it. Um, but uh, it's important today, and some people are really good at the online promotion, better at it than others, and that doesn't hurt at all. But at the end of the day, you've got to have a good product to sell. You know, you've got to have a good story. Mm -hmm. Gotta have something different and something about your writing that makes people want to read it. So, so when did the Lost Fleet series take form? When when did you begin writing on that? What year? Well, I actually started writing it in um, let's see, would have been about two thousand five, two thousand six. Um, no, two thousand four. Excuse me. Um. But the ideas behind it, I had been playing with for, oh, several years before then. Mm. I'd, I'd actually come up with the uh, half of it when a writer who works in the Star Trek universe asked a bunch of other writers. She said, can you do a long retreat in space in Star Trek? Mm. And we all said, no, it wouldn't work because of the way Star Trek handles uh, faster than light travel. You'd either get away or you'd be caught. Mm -hmm. So couldn't do that. But it got me to thinking: Could you do a long retreat in space in a way that made sense, that worked? And that was just stayed in the back of my head for a long time. Uh, and then there was another concept I'd been thinking about for a long time: this idea of the sleeping hero, which is a common thing in human cultures. It's all over the place. Uh, the ones we're most familiar with, you know, somebody like King Arthur. Uh, who's supposedly uh, not dead, just sleeping, and when needed will uh, wake up and save his people. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I thought, you know, they, they say that this, this sleeping hero people, that they're originally somebody real was behind all that. And I just thought, what if that real person actually did wake up and discover, hey, we think you're the greatest hero ever, and you got to save us. Right, but he, but he was just an average Joe. That was right. in a in a lucky situation, right? Where the the parallel that I saw in that whenever whenever I heard it the first time um, was actually in the the two thousand nine Star Trek movie, right? Where Kirk's dad stays the lone guy on the bridge and 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 basically does the last stand against the enemy to allow all the civilians to escape, right? So 
it 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 would be instead of him dying, you know, gloriously in that, but he was just thought dead and great legends sprang up about him, right? But then they find him as a popsicle many years later and thaw him out and then he has to to have the crisis of trying to live up to the legend that was built about him. So, but it but it's a I I find that's kind of interesting though uh, about the whole um, that last stand against the enemy, just you know, trying to 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 go out saving as many people as you can and self sacrifice, um, and then just through pure dumb luck, he actually gets discovered. You know, what was it like a hundred years later? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's um. I mean, the last stand. That's one of the. It's a, one of the toughest things that can happen in the military, and it happens. And so it's a situation that naturally makes you think, what would, what would someone do in a case like that? Would you mm. live up to the requirements? Would you be able to hold your ground? Um, there's even a phrase for it, you know, the forlorn hope, which tells you what, you know, is expected in the last stand. You're, you're not expected to make it out. Um, and it, it takes a special kind of person to, to stick through that. And so it's an interesting, very interesting topic to try to write about. Yeah. When, when you were in the Navy, did you get any submarine time? Or was it all surface I, ships? I spent some time on submarines. You know, it's only a few days at a time, uh, not extensively. Okay. Because it's um, a, a thing that I have always been interested in, and I, I don't know what your, com- your computer gaming experience is, uh, but some of the submarine simulations that had been made that were mm-hmm. that were super deep, and submarine stuff is always a game of detection. Uh, of course, su- surface ships are too. Uh, you know, who who sees the enemy first generally wins. But it, with submarines, it's a cat and mouse game, and it's about detection and that. And I have always thought, well, nobody's really done a space game where they look at the actual physics of just interstellar flight or in system flight and one of the things that that struck home with me in in your books immediately was that well the best detection is with light because that's the fastest wave and if you're detecting with anything else it, it's too slow you know you can't you can't use like radio emissions or whatever it it takes way too long um and then if you use active sensors it takes twice as long because the ping has to go out and then come back. So so it's basically passive sensors keyed off a light seems to be what you know what everybody does. Um so so is that uh on these ships is are the sensors actually just arrays of telescopes that are scanning at all times looking for any kind of uh photon emissions or well not just telescopes. I mean they're there are sensors that are looking across the entire spectrum, hmm. the full spectrum from, you know, the, the deep infrared up to the, the highest ultraviolet, uh, looking for any emissions anywhere along that. Okay. Because, you know, objects are going to give off heat, which you're going to see as, as, you know, light radiation. Hmm. Um, uh, and your, or radio waves can come off them, you know, any number of things. So you're going to be looking through the entire spectrum. Okay. And, I mean, we do that now to some extent. We we try to look at a full spectrum analysis to try to uh, spot things that would not be visible if you were just looking in one part of the visual spectrum, for example. Okay, but it but is it pretty much a it's a detection game because they see when somebody jumps into a system. I would I would assume mm-hmm. that there is a, a flare of energy and it's very obvious that somebody just entered the system. Um, but that light got to you you know, four hours after the event, 20 hours after the event. It just depends on how far you are. Um, and this is actually the first series that I'd read that takes into account that light and communications take time between yeah. ships. And when you're I commanding so. a formation of ships, then when you issue orders, you know there's a five to ten minute delay before that guy's even going to hear you and then begin to act. Um, and and then as far as like the red shift of as you begin to approach, uh, you know, a, a fraction of light speed, you know, say around 10 percent or whatever, that your perception of space around you begins to distort. So you can't really pick targets. And if it takes 
a, a laser, we, we always think of that as an instantaneous thing because light's so fast. But if it actually takes a couple minutes or, you know, just even seconds for a shot to get to a target and you can't clearly see where that target is and they're maneuvering so your computers would have pretty much a cone of, of prediction to shoot in. But when you're shooting with a beam of light, you have to be pretty precise. So I would think that, you know, the space combat would be pretty tough. So that's going to dictate slower speeds and closer range. Or you're not going to have a hope of hitting anything. Yeah, yeah, closer range. I mean, I approach the whole thing from an, an attitude of not how it's been done in the past, but, um, and I guess this was my Navy training. I was looking at, like, okay, if this is a real situation, if this is your real battlefield, and it's literally infinite in dimensions, and there's very little in the way of obstacles, and you can see for tremendous distances. You know, what are your ships going to have to be like? What are they going to have to be capable of? And how are they going to fight? And I decided to try, you know, taking into account the real light speed stuff instead of the um, the instantaneous communications and sensor stuff because I wanted to see if I could make it work. Oh, and uh, inadvertently, did. Did. one of the side. <laughs> Thank you. So fantastic. One of the side effects of that was that I finally managed to uh, get across how big space is. Because, you know, when you're talking about uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of kilometers, uh, any person's eyes are going to glaze over. We can't get numbers like that. But if you say it's going to take an hour for light to go from this point to where the other ship is, then people can say, wow, that's big. Um, yeah. it, it, it presents the vastness of space in a way that, that we can grasp. And it's instantly uh, understandable, which yes. I thought was great. Now, I wanted to say there's a few things I loved about your space combat besides the time dilation and everything. One, that you still, that the, mod, the futuristic Navy still relies on physical munitions, which just makes sense. You know? Yeah, some of them, yeah, like the grape shot, you know, it's, it's just, I mean, it's, uh, it's a kinetic projectile. It, moving at high speed, it's going to do a lot of damage if it hits something. Exactly. I also loved how uh, um, rocks were used for orbital bombardment. That was a favorite of mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, again, if, if you, you don't need a warhead if you're dropping something from that high up. Uh, it, it's, it's going to do a tremendous amount of damage. Um, and, of course, it's much easier to manufacture a solid chunk of metal than it is to build something with a warhead in it. Exactly, or something that shoots a laser beam or something like that. Yeah, it's like putting well, a nuclear bomb in, in you know, when, when you drop a, a shell that's multi-ton from orbit, then putting a nuke on it is, is just sort of an afterthought because <laughs> yeah. it's already going to yeah, do the, the point, damage. Really. <laughs> yeah, what's the point? <laughs> Exactly. I also loved how, because of the uh, time needed to make combat happen, it kind of, it kind of shows the hurry up and wait facet of combat really well. There's a lot of just time waiting, and then there's seconds of pure terror as the ships fly by each other, shooting all kinds of things, and then you got to figure out what to do next. I I, I really love that aspect of the combat. Yeah, that was, and again, I thought that was um, something about space combat that you'd have to have because the ships have to be able to move very fast. And it doesn't make sense that they would move very, very fast and then slow down to a dead stop next to each other when they actually fought. They'd tear past each other like uh, um, like SR-71's dog fighting, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, there, there's been uh, games in the in the long history... Oh God, Brian! How long have we been playing these games since the '80s? Um, but At least. in that in, in the history, I've been playing them. yeah. Oh, you do pl you do play them? Oh yeah, I've, I've definitely played some. Yeah, Wing well, Commander we'll, on, you know. Oh, we will have to talk about your bona fides in that uh, area a little bit later. <laughs> yeah. Did Did you uh, when you were in the Navy? Did you guys break out harpoon a lot? And harpoon and... was just um, coming online. There, there wasn't uh, very much of it, actually. Um, well, I mean, I as far as the board game, was there was there much yeah, tabletop gaming that went on? Game. Uh, not too much, mainly because um, when you're a member of ship's company, um, spare time is something you spend sleeping, if, if you can. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
uh, basically you don't have much of a life. <laughs> so we didn't. I didn't do much war gaming when I was uh, on ship's company. Uh, we were we were too busy doing the the, the real thing. So oh, okay. I didn't leave room for that. Uh, well, I also wanted to say I love how your your uh, series mixes. I mean, there is faster than light travel. I, that doesn't mean once you break out of your warp feet, your um, your your jump tube or whatever, that things are instantaneous. There's no like magic sensor or magic engine that makes everything just happen. You know, it just felt much more grounded. Yeah, and, and really that makes me that kind of thing makes me write better because I can't depend on a magic sensor or a magic weapon. I've got to figure out how would you actually do this? How would my characters actually command in these situations? How could you actually do things? And it makes me write it as if it was real. Hmm. Have, you actually, like, have you actually like plotted the combat out on like graph paper or anything? Have you done like that? Is it all in your head? Like how do you plot uh, it's, it's, out? It's, it's three dimensional. I, I do it in my head because you know, I used my experience uh, as a ship driver. Mm. I, did, you know, I had to know relative motion and uh, the relative motion of very large objects moving around each other. And then different rates of it with the aircraft above and the submarines below. Um, so I just, uh, yeah, I work it out in my head. Yeah, and there really aren't, if I recall, there really aren't like fighters in this universe but it would no. kind of like not make sense to have them no they, they don't really i mean lucas started the whole space fighter thing because yeah. well he was doing a movie and <laughs> they made great visuals to have a space fighter thing so he copied world war ii pacific yeah, battles exactly um but you know the reason you've got uh, fighters and ships on earth is because the fighters are operating in air and mm -hmm. the ships are operating in the water in space, they're all operating in the exact same environment, which means a big ship with a big engine is just as maneuverable as a little ship with a little engine. It's it's thrust to mass. Um, so the space fighter is basically um, doesn't have those maneuvering advantages that it would in a planetary environment. Instead, it's just got less of everything. So I think you could make a case for a PT boat like space fighter that makes sense. relatively short endurance and you know one punch situation but if you're talking fighters then you're talking something you know aerospace something close to a planet that can pop in and out of that air and, and do things close in right and the fleet doesn't really get too close to planets usually yeah well i mean Not otherwise really otherwise you'd need some sort of a barrier that they would have to slip past like if it was a standoff, um, like in the in the the recent reboot of Battlestar Galactica, the way that they mm -hmm. kind of justified the fighters there is because well they have one military ship and it can't be everywhere, so that helps. Um, but also the combat would be you know the Cylon base star jumps in, it's stationary. The Galactica is fairly stationary, and they have a missile duel, and it, and it's basically we're going to throw so many missiles at each other. And, and just hope that some get in. But you have a, just an area of devastation in the middle, and in order to get shots in, you send your fighters and your bombers around the outside to kind of do flanking. Um, and it worked for that, but that's because the, the two primary combatants are stationary, as opposed yeah, to it's, in... It's funny that the, a lot of those battles, I mean, you're basically talking a... a a line of battle engagement like if if they were on the surface of the ocean you've got the big battleships slugging away at each other yeah and you've got the smaller ships trying to to swing in there and fire torpedoes and stuff getting closer and the other side's uh, small escorts are trying to stop them and everything um it's funny how often that scenario shows up in space and you can <laughs> you can make the technology justify it you know, mm. if, if you uh if you put your technology in a certain way, you can justify it. Um, but, but to me, I always see the battleships slamming away at each other when something like that happens. Hmm. Which yeah, is, so you know, good. It's well, much more naval. It's much, it makes much, I mean, we identify with the Star Wars and the Battlestar because it's a little more, it's kind of approachable. It's like all fast-paced and, you know, visual. And I think it'd be, like, have you cons ever considered making these books into like a visual medium, like a TV show or a movie? I can't no, imagine that would be easy. 
<laughs> no, no, it uh, it would be it'd be interesting. There's somebody trying to um, market them right now. Oh, and, oh. Uh, they they are the books are big in Japan. They sell well in Japan, so I have you know mm. I have a hope that you know some anime studio will will give it a shot. That and that's oh, exactly wow. where I was going. I was going to say you need to talk to some anime people because they can make anything on the cheap because you know environment doesn't matter and special effects they can do whatever right you know we got giant robots oh, yeah, spaceships they're amazing. That, yeah they're amazing i was just uh watching uh girls in panzer which is just outstanding recreations of world war ii era tanks it's amazing what they did with them oh really yeah i mean you, you you would not even think of Western animators wouldn't even think of recreating the specific uh, views through the range finders of the different tanks, model tanks. But they've got that in there. You look through the range finder of a Firefly, and it's the range finder of a Firefly. You look through of a Mark IV Pan Panzer, and it's the viewfinder of a German tank. Amazing. <laughs> so, so in your ships, because we were talking about the battle tactics a, a bit there. Um, and where uh, Jack Geary, because he, he was from the old school and he was trained whenever, it, he was before the attrition basically sucked all the wisdom out of the military. Um, so he remembered how to fight in formations and use more advanced tactics and that, that had, had just evaporated from the scene by the time he came back which made him s sort of a super commander because he, he knew how to use, you know, common sense and maneuvers. Um, so those things, as far as the maneuvers and, and that that he did, um, and uh, like I said, I've, I've gotten a, a lot less through the books than Brian and my wife did, so maybe this came up. But is there a valid tactic in there for, for just running silent, like just shut all your emissions off once you're headed toward the enemy and cruise in, and then you get a first strike before they detect you, you know, it, because that would make it more like submarine combat, right? You get going the right way, you shut everything down, and then you get a sneak attack kind of thing. Well, but but this, they always seem to stay together in, in groups, almost like a bomber yeah, formation. The, the state of human sensors in, in the Lost Fleet universe is such that it's very hard for a large object to be stealthy. You can do it with smaller ones like mines or something, but if you've got something big and it's moving fast, uh, at this point they can't hide it. Um, there are ways to hide things. Uh, don't want to spoil things for you, but um, like the alien enigmas figure out a way to hide from human ships. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, they're they're hacking them um, because you know once if you're only looking at the universe through your systems, then you know. There's your there's your Achilles heel as far as uh, stealth. Mm. So how how much automation is involved in these ships? Because you have it's fully crewed by humans, and like even the gun turrets require like what is it three or four crew to man one mm -hmm. of the you know one of the um, they weren't called laser turrets hell lances. Um, so so to do that, so you you made it so that it's it's not like you know the syndicate could just send robot ships out or whatever and, no, and not have a human element um yeah obviously you need a human element but also uh, and again this is navy experience and, and what's going on right now the, the robotic systems um they have a tendency to have glitches if you hmm. don't have a human in the loop uh who's who's there to override the glitch and reset things um well you're stuck Just right like, but you know you send something to mars and it gets a glitch and oops yeah, well, the uh, the thing that I guess where I'm looking at is like your targeting computers and things mm -hmm. like that because you have such a delay between when you see an enemy and when you decide to pull the trigger on them, and then you have flight time of your ordnance to get there. Mm -hmm. So the the enemy, of course, well, if if the shot is coming in at light speed, the first warning that they're going to have is getting hit by it because they're not going to see it coming because it, it comes at the speed of their perception. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's a thing of like, once you know the enemy's there and they're approximately in range, then you, I would assume you flip the switch and start some random evasive maneuvers to try to not yeah. be as predictably in the place where their ordinance is going to be shot. Yeah, so, you, do, you do try to um, 
wobble a bit, which is where something like grape shot comes in handy because it's a little of an area weapon. But because the ships are moving so fast, your uh, engagement window where you're actually within range is uh, incredibly tiny in, ter in time terms. Yeah. Um, and so the, the combat computers are pretty much, you say, okay, okay, fire at this when we get in range. And they pull the trigger because it's happening too fast for human senses to react. Hmm. Um, and then you come back around and you, you do it again. But it's, uh, you, you're heavily dependent on automated systems for the fire control because it's simply happening too fast for human senses to register, usually. Right. So a lot of the games that we had, have played, of course, uh, they bow to the, to the George Lucas aesthetics, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Wing Commander and, and that. Yeah, well, and, and yeah, it makes fun. sense to, to people, right? So the, but the other game, the, the one that stands out hugely is, uh, what was it? It was F Elite Frontier. Was that the one, Brian? Which, well, it was, it was a David Braben thing. It was, it was, it was Frontier 2, I think. It was the one that we talk about where it, where it just descended into jousting combat every time. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, yeah. Elite 2 and 3 have the same problem. Yeah. Okay, so it, and that's the thing, is you would detect an enemy, and you head toward them, and they're coming at you, and the closure rate is so fast that you get like two shots and zip past each other, and then you turn 180, and, you, uh, and of course, you know, momentum, right? So you have to lose all mm -hmm. that speed and then accelerate at each other again, and you take a couple of shots at the nose and repeat until somebody gets lucky. Um, it, but the combat in, in Lost Fleet wasn't so much like that because it was formations of ships. So you would get somebody right. every time. You know, it, it, right. it wasn't... And I actually used um, the, the models for the formation uh, that I thought of were World War II bomber boxes. Hmm. Because, you know, oh. it's a heavy bombers, it's, it's a three-dimensional formation providing interlocking fire. And so that kind of thing, yeah, you could do that in space. It would it make sense. Well, and one ship's yeah. not going to be able to project enough grape shot on its own to, to guarantee a hit. Exactly. But if you get ten ships and they all throw a bunch of ball bearings out there, right, right, then you get a cloud. So... And, and the ships have shields, so you have to, you know, first knock down the shield, and then you have to uh, get through any armor on the hull, and then hope you hit something vital. Yeah. So when you, when you were designing the technology of this, did you did you start writing, you know, these are the situations and the things that I want, or did you kind of sweat out the details of, okay, this is the kind of technology level that I'm going to go for? You know, like, which came first, the the technology or the situation that demanded it? Um, well, I knew in general what I wanted to do, you know, like have battles in systems uh, at some light speeds. And then it was uh, a matter of figuring out what technology would work with um, the way I'd set things up. Because mm -hmm. I needed to have that in order to know how the story was going to go the situations my characters would encounter and uh, the things they could do and what they couldn't do because a lot of a lot of things that happen in a story a lot of things that drive a story just like in real life is what you can't do uh, mm. it's 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 nice to be able to do something but more often than not the the decisive factor is well I can't do this I'd love to be able to do it but I can't so here's mm. the, here's my available options so I need to know what they could do and what they couldn't do Right. In order to figure out how the story would go. Because when, whenever we have discussions, like in, in our IRC channel, uh, there's a couple of people that I talk to in there, um, and there, there was a, a board game that's uh, Attack Vector Tactical. I don't know if you're familiar with, with that. Um, Ad Astra made it. And then they also got the license for um, the Honor Harrington universe. So he produced mm -hmm. some games mm -hmm. in that. And that's, uh, it's an interesting game. It's, it's very difficult to make the mental hurdle of, of the cliff of learning that thing um, because you have to do vector calculations in your head, basically. And they, they give you a cheat sheet, oh, and it kind of helps. But you are playing a hex-based vector movement game. And to try to conceptualize where you're going to end up at the end of you know two turns from now if you execute like a 90 degree turn and thrust and it's it's kind of mind-bending um but 
in, in a game like that, one of the things, his ships have these giant radiators on the tail. And, and I talked to him, I can't remember his name right now, but I, it was some years ago and we had a conversation. And, you know, I asked him, well, with the radiators on there, and he, and he said, well, he had talked to some, some NASA guys and said, you know, ha- had some discussions about, well, if we had these ships for real and if they were going to be any, in any way plausible. And they said, well, the problem is if, in order to have enough thrust from the ship, to be able to accelerate to like a tenth of light speed and anything under a matter of months, then you're going to have to put out so much energy that any kind of conduction of that energy back through the hull of the ship is just going to cook the crew. So you have to have a way to radiate that, and, and it's a problem, right? Um, and then as far as actually being able to accelerate a ship that quickly and then change its direction and and do things so that you can have a cinematic engagement rather than be you know we flew past each other and took a shot and uh and it'll be about five days before we can get turned around (laughs) and and go back there so you have to make some concessions to story right yes but Mm -hmm. but do you sweat the stuff about (laughs) well i'm gonna say these ships have shields but do i have to think about you know how do shields actually work and and well, you know, or or do you just say well you know star wars star trek it's an accepted thing and we'll just say shields and everybody will accept that uh i guess sort of half and half i mean again it, you have to have a, a set a limitation on what this thing can do uh-huh. uh to prevent it from becoming the the magic get out of jail free card system that's going to solve your problem uh so kind of a combination of both i want to have a system that's uh clearly enough defined to um have clear things it can do and can't do but Mm. at the same time i don't want to get into nuts and bolts details because you know we don't know how this stuff's going to work i you know i've had people ask me how does the anti the artificial gravity work and i don't know yeah, uh, if I knew that, that would be a good thing. Um, well, it's it's a thing I think that's good enough. You know, it, when when it colors the story and it and it feels like okay, some concessions are made to reality, but you know, it, there's enough reality to ground it in that where it's not pure space fantasy, you know, space opera yes. thing. Yes. But absolutely. then again, you you have to you have to throw some assumptions in to, to say, well, th- this is fun. And it drives the story, so we'll allow it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like you were talking about the vector stuff. Uh, when I think about space combat with uh, basically limited thrust, limited power capability, and lots and lots of momentum, uh, I think of things like galley warfare. You know, back in the old days, where mm-hmm. they really had to pre plan everything they did because they only had so much propulsion power. And once they committed to something, they were on that. And changing it was hard. And I think space combat will have a lot of similarities to that, at least at first, uh, where you really have to pre-plan your moves and figure out where you're going to be three moves down the line, how your vectors are going to work out. Because hmm. you can't just spin on a dime and stop on a dime. That's It's going to be a big part of it. Yeah. H- has anybody talked to you about maybe a board game adaptation? Um, a few well, not seriously at this point. No, it's uh, um, it would be interesting to try to do that, uh, <laughs> but there have been <laughs> there have been uh, no serious talks as of yet. Okay, I, I think it would be an an interesting like harpoon in space kind of thing that yeah. that you know if it had a if it had its own consistency that that obeyed the laws of its universe, which seems to be you know, the goal you set for yourself and lived up to is you establish these are the laws of my universe and then you obey them throughout. Um, be, because that was a thing that, that uh, my wife had said was, well, there was no Wesley Crusher character. Nobody invented <laughs> magic and, and changed stuff. And I was like, well, did the weapons change at all? And she's like, no, they just figured out how to use what they had better. But it was a thing of attrition. Like, you're, you're always working with less. So Yes, yes. And, uh, I, I mean, as I said before, it makes me write better because I can't just, oh, we'll invent this and it'll get us out of this. When I was doing the sixth book, um, 
and I was coming into the climactic battle in the syndicate's home star system. Yeah. It was too easy. It was just going to be too easy for the Alliance to win. So I thought, I've got to come up with something that the bad guys can do to make this hard. And I did. I came up with a trap. It was a beautiful trap. It was such a beautiful trap that I had no idea how the good guys were going to get out of it using the technology they had. And it literally took me a couple of months to figure out how they could do it. But I wasn't going to take a shortcut. I was, you know, okay, they're stuck. This is the situation. What are they going to do? And eventually I figured out what they could do. So when you write, do you start with the end situation and then backfill to figure out how they got there? Or do you start out as... Uh, these are some key points that I want to hit or do you start at the beginning and you're just as surprised as the rest of us where it ends up yes <laughs> uh, it, it does tend to be a combination of things I, I usually have at least a general idea of the ending sometimes a very specific one um, I know where we're starting um, and then I will have a general idea of where I'm going in between there but as I'm writing I'm gonna let the characters make decisions as they're presented with situations and they may make decisions that are not what I was originally thinking and then I try to accommodate those because as the characters go on they develop their own I mean, they've got real personalities mm. and I don't want them you know how this kind of story where the characters are just doing things because they've got to do that for the plot Right, you know, like the hor the typical horror movie thing where oh, let's all separate now, you know, uh, go off yeah. by ourselves so the monster can get us all one by one. Um, I wanted to avoid that, so I I always let my characters have a say in how the story goes, and sometimes that produces some significant uh, changes in the story. It's it sounds like the writing technique of playing chess against yourself, where you know you, you sit down, and make your say. move, and then spin the board around and let the other guy, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I was yeah. gonna say it sounds more like a a pen and paper role playing game in your head, where you're not only the GM but every member of your party uh, <laughs> making decisions as you go. Well, yeah, I suppose there's a lot to that. You know, I had to. I was one of the first people to buy a Dungeons and Dragons game and uh, <laughs> hmm. draw out the dungeons on the graph paper and everything. And, uh, See, that, that's another yeah, market I'm, for this. You've you've got a source book, or you know, you you could make uh, like the the Lost Fleet Bible. Right of of like the locations and the whatever, that. and just have a compendium and and say, oh yeah, this is adaptable to Star Frontiers and GURPS and you know what whatever mm -hmm. people play these days. Um, but yeah, I th I think uh, a compendium of that for the fans would would be something that people would eat up, you know, especially well, if you deep I... dive into the technologies and. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you have like stats for all the ships. Do you have like you know the complement and the the tonnage and the speed and all that fun and the armament do you, do you have all that mapped out well yeah but not well organized um ah. we've had uh, some preliminary talks with uh, some people about doing a tech manual type thing for the last i would buy that day one day freaking one especially if it came in hardcover you would have a sale sir I'm just saying. okay i love tech i love science fiction technical manuals we, we were actually talking about maybe doing it in the form of an, an alliance um, intelligence document. <laughs> you know, it's laying out, uh, you know, here's our assessment of the situation, and here's the enemy ships, and here's our ships. and um, So it would be uh, positioned within the universe itself rather than something external to it. Right. Now, one thing I, I wanted to say I love about the space combat is that not every ship in the fleet is a combatant. You have these auxiliary ships which are amazingly important but in a lot of other um sci-fi series you usually don't they barely touch on that sort of thing like i think bsg had that one episode with the mining ship that made jump fuel mm -hmm. or something but that was like it and it wasn't very good but you you got you you properly make the auxiliaries very very important yeah, I wanted to emphasize the importance of logistics in in the, the situation. I mean, the auxiliaries make their fuel cells, they, they right. make their expendable weaponry. You know, food's an issue. Um, a lot of fiction stories do avoid that. They have the miracle power source that lasts for five years. The or, replicators. You know, the, yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff. But 
you know, in the real world, you look at the historical situation, stuff that's going on now, logistics drives an awful lot of the decisions people make. Well, uh, especially when you're in a long back. retreat scenario, because that's your yeah. most yeah. important thing is to keep in supply. Exactly. And, and that because that uh, does drive real world decisions, by putting that in there, it makes it feel real to people because they say, even if they don't recognize it necessarily consciously, subconsciously, they know, yeah, this is like in the real world. Hmm. And I think that pays off. Yeah, because that, that's, that's a massive factor in the decisions Gary makes throughout uh, the, entire, the entire base series. Which is great, you know, because a lot of science fiction skips that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're you're running out of fuel, and you're like, man, is this going to last long enough for me to get home? Is it going to last long enough for me to to, to win this battle? Um, that's 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 real world. Yeah, and it's yeah, and it's like, what do you face, do? Yeah. What do you do with your auxiliaries? We're about to engage in combat. Where can I put them that they're safe? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and, and and also I could sacrifice I could sacrifice gunships in order to keep the auxiliaries safe. You know, it, it's like I might lose people, but if I leave them open, then I, you know, and and not make that sacrifice. Uh, you know, it, it's like I have to lose some swords to keep the butter. Yeah, yeah. Now I want to ask. Um, especially when it comes to protecting auxiliaries and stuff, there was, in the early part of the books at least, a lot of resistance to how Gary, uh, was it Geary or Gary? Geary. Geary. How Geary uh, tried to run the fleet. They, they just wanted to go gung-ho and didn't want to listen and didn't want to coordinate. Did you kind of run into people that were that stubborn in the actual military? <laughs> well, you do, you always run into them, yeah, but... Um, in this particular case, I was using the uh, examples, which are unfortunately very prevalent in history, of, uh, of cases where um, um, nothing's working. And so people just fall back on pride and beating their heads against the wall. You know, yeah. the World War II, excuse me, World War I type scenario where, okay, it didn't work, let's do it again. It didn't work, <laughs> let's do it again. Um, and people actually do that simply out of frustration, uh, simply because it's something they can do. Uh, that sort of um, simplistic uh, belief that honor and courage will carry the day against firepower. And it doesn't. Hmm. Oh, you guys were bringing up anime earlier. Uh, Knack in the chat says anime does a better job of dealing with support ships and auxiliaries than a lot of Western sci-fi. Is that true? Mm -hmm. I think so, um, and that's probably because Japan, uh, you know, they're they're in the Pacific. Um, to them, it was always long distance, long missions type situations. I think they're mm. they're better suited for it. Uh, Americans tend to think in terms of continental stuff we got big country um and it's it's hard to get too far away from your base but i think the japanese do pay more attention to that kind of thing well that makes sense oh because i want a game man i want a game of your books seriously <laughs> i know there'd be a lot of time compression involved um between engagements but i yeah. still want i still want that i still want I, cause you, did you ever play the um, the Rules of Engagement series back in the day? Oh, gosh, I don't think so. I mean, the name is familiar to me, but I can't remember ever playing it. Uh, they didn't deal with the uh, dilation of, of light and everything the way that your books do, but they came the closest to having to deal with... Uh, they kind of did because messages, would, if ships were farther away, messages would take longer to get to oh, yeah, members yeah, of your I fleet. Uh, so they kind of dealt with it a little bit, but that was, I'm thinking, the closest we've come to what your books t tackle. And those are great games. Uh, those are phenomenal games. Kind of hard to play now because the interface is crazy. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> but nothing can be as bad as that, what was it, like 1973 Star Trek that you were playing? Uh, uh... 
Oh yeah. <laughs> Trek seven yeah. Trek seventy three. That's what it was actually called. And I got called to task for that. I don't know. Did you ever play that game, John? Do you know what I'm talking was, about? Was that the one that worked on a mainframe and you just typed in the commands? It was. It was one of the many that were between the 60s and like early to mid 70s there were a bunch of star trek games that came out and the most popular and most well known of those is one where like you had a uh like a nine point grid kind of like a numeric keypad and you would use mm -hmm. the numeric keypad to kind of point like go down like 90 degrees or you know and you would use the keypad to tell you know which direction to shoot which direction to move with this one you actually had to type it all out and it was crazy difficult. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the one I remember then. The one I remember, we quickly figured out that there was one maneuver you could do as soon as a, a Klingon showed up. You do this one maneuver, and you fire at this one angle, and you'd always nail him. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. So, and yeah, henceforth kind of known as the hammering maneuver. You figure out the trick, yeah. <laughs> the hammering <laughs> You know, you, f you figure out the trick, and then, okay, no challenge here, because it was a pretty one-dimensional game. Well, they all kind of were back in the day. I mean, for as all, some of those, some of them still hold up, though. The, the, the Super Star Trek I was just talking about from, sorry, 1978, that's still fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Starfleet, remember Starfleet from? Oh, yeah, uh, uh -huh. still, Yeah, that's kind of the, an EGA Trek and Net Trek. Those are kind of build, those kind of the same kind of formula that, but built upon that base of the numeric keypad to do everything. And, uh, yeah, those are those are still fun games. I still play them every once in a while. You know, when you couldn't depend on, on the, the graphics to try to carry the game, the flash, then you had to have a, <laughs> a better game. You I know, agree. You tried to, have, tried to have to build a good game out of it. Well, and that, you... there Sorry. wasn't so much effort that could go into the graphics, right? So right, if, right. You, if you have X amount of development time, the bulk of it is going to go into the AI and and this mm -hmm. you know the user interface and and such. Um, so so yeah, I, I think that current developers are are kind of in a hard place because you can make the the coolest game ever, but if it doesn't stand up visually, like somebody will look at a screenshot and be like, oh, you know, <laughs> and and then you just don't get yeah. anywhere. Yeah, like some um, games still are into that. Like we just had a couple weeks ago, uh, it was a Tactical Space Command. Yeah, which is a phenomenal and game that looks like a radar harpoon. scope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's like it's basically there. There's planets and there's rings around them, and then you have your ships that are that are symbols on the map. And you know, my diamond has a circle around it, and that's my detection radius. <laughs> and I can organize them into a fleet, uh, and and it's a pretty cool game. I I actually I sat and played it the whole time we were doing the podcast. I had a stream going of me pl being terrible at this game, um, <laughs> <laughs> but losing horribly. Um, but yeah, fun game. But there visually, there's not much there. But it doesn't need to be because it it actually has an authenticity in that you're kind of looking at a radar scope and and yeah. pushing your guys around a map. So there's definitely still a market for that sort of thing. It's just not as big as the whiz bang, flash bang, star citizen -y, elite dangerous -y. <laughs> Yeah, well, it would be interesting, though, in that game. And, and I think we actually brought that up on that show, uh, you know, thinking about John's books. Because when you give orders to a ship and then it engages in combat and that, what would happen if there was a delay? You know, like, yeah, I, well, I might well. not find out for a couple minutes what actually transpired because it takes that long for the signals to come back to home base. So Right. So now, John, you mentioned Wing Commander earlier. What would, what would you say some of the other uh, big space games you've really loved? What would, what, would, what would some of those be? Oh, God, I'm trying to remember. It's been... Uh, I've had this subsequent life with the, the, the kids and everything where I haven't been able to do as nearly as much. Uh, yeah. How old are your kids now? Stands out. Uh, um, well, the the uh, oldest two are 20 and 19. Uh, they're both autistic, so um, they're still with us. And mm -hmm. uh, then the, the youngest one is um, is 16. And so, he's not uh, and he's not autistic. Well, he's on the spectrum. We we oh. we got a, we got a triple play, but we've got him just about recovered. So uh, he's he's doing okay. What does that mean? Uh, J just about recovered. Well, but by uh, a combination of uh, medications and diet, we were able to get him. Um, so he's uh, pretty much typical in terms of uh, social interaction and everything else. He was always smart, 
but uh, uh, just um, well, at one point he was withdrawing and, and losing language and stuff. But uh, we, wow. we compensated for that and cut him back. Yeah. Well, it, it's. I think it's fascinating that recently they've made such strides in the treatment because they realize, yeah. you know, it's it's not what you got and you know deal with it. It's it's more like, well, you actually can work with this, and you know. Yeah. And... Yeah. Long ways to go, unfortunately. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it it's, it makes life interesting. Um, trying to remember the uh, move, Master of Orion. Ah, of course. Uh, didn't like Moo too though. It's just got too much into detail. Really? You know, uh, I, oh. I just remember it being just you know you you had to spend so much time doing bookkeeping stuff between your planets. You didn't have time to play the game. Type We're thing. gonna get letters on this one. Probably. <laughs> that, that's just how I remember. I could be wrong. It's been a long time. No, you... no, no one's saying you're wrong. It's just most people I talk to about Moo. There, it's like one of those things where like, ooh, you know, Moo too, ooh. Oh my god, it's the best thing. It's the best thing ever. Still. Really? How many years? It's like 18 fucking years. Oh my god. It came out yeah, in 1996. They, they might have modified it a lot since the time when I you know, remember it from. You know, they might have uh, automated a lot of the things that uh, were, were tedious. Well, you know, for the most part, I let all the automation happen in that game because I enjoyed mm -hmm. designing the ships, but I did not like micromanaging combat. But I didn't trust the auto resolution. I wanted to see it in case the AI yeah. did something mm -hmm. ignorant. So I would build these ships, you know, and spend a lot of time designing them, but then I'd just go and be a spectator to the combat and, and kind of, yeah. uh, you know, either experience yeah. joy or rage based on what the yeah, AI that did. Was, that was a part of it was building the ships. Yes, definitely. Have you ever uh, played uh, Have you ever played Sword of the Stars? The first one, not the second one. The second one's bad. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, really good game. The, the for, and cheap too. You can pick it up for like ten bucks on on Steam. Mm -hmm. um, what was interesting in that is that each race came with a completely different propulsion technology and weapon technology that they you know. So depending on mm -hmm. who you were playing, you had a completely different play style. Like the there was an insectoid race that could reproduce very quickly, but they couldn't travel very fast at all. So they were they would travel at sublight speed. And it would take them multiple years to get to another system. So they would be very late to the game in creating colonies. However, when they did start to make colonies, they would colonize everything in sight and then launch out again. You know, so every time they would land, they would reproduce in mass, launch a zillion ships, and, and you would have woe mm. be unto you if you were in, in a close planet and they showed up. And then once they established in a... In a uh, system they could build a gate and nobody else had gate technology so they could it took forever to get there but once they'd build a stargate then their entire fleet could come in yeah I, re I remember that game now yeah it was it was neat because it had all those distinctive characteristics you know everybody yeah. wasn't the basically the same except they look different mm hmm so you yeah. have in your books you have one alien race but there's not a whole lot that's really revealed about them right like uh, Actually, by now there's three. Oh, three different alien races. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because it. <laughs> well, it, catch up, man. well, further yeah. books. So do I. So well, it's do I. well, it's books beyond the Lost Fleet. Uh, right, right into the Beyond the Frontier. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So the 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 thing about the aliens, um, as far in I didn't hear the sixth book, but she's she's told me about it, right? And, um. Mm -hmm. But it's the the thing of like you, you, there was never a meeting of oh here's the aliens and here's what they look like and here's how they act and that they they were still a mystery. Right, but, the enigmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, do you do you ever actually spill the beans on all that stuff or do you keep them an enigma? Um, more stuff gets learned about them, uh, but they are, as it turns out, a um, by human standards, a very paranoid race, very mm. uh, secretive. Um, right, because it seemed do like not want anybody else finding out anything about them, and it and it seemed like the the thing was they were manipulating the the two human factions to fight each other, because as long as the humans are busy wiping each other out, then we don't have to worry about them encroaching. Yes, and and um, 
this this is a slight spoiler, but basically we figure out that well the Alliance fleet figures out at one point that the reasons the Enigmas are so scared of us, want to get rid of us, is because we are, you know, we're the monkey race. We are very curious. We always want to learn about things. And to them, that is the worst possible thing, because they don't want anybody learning about them. So that's driving their motivations as far as we're concerned. They don't so, want anything to do with us. They don't want us anywhere near them because they don't want us learning about them. Right, because absence of knowledge is pretty good uh, security, right? If you don't know mm-hmm. that we're here and you don't know what our capabilities are, then you're less prone to mess with us because you don't exactly know what our limits are. Exactly. And then, uh, you know, in the Beyond the Frontier series, they encounter two other uh, races. Um, the the kicks and the um, dancers. Okay, and, so the uh, is are the further books also uh, like large fleet type of fiction, or do well, they get I, more into an individual character and his, uh, you know, like a ship? Or... It it varies. Uh, Gary's fleet is actually shrinking some due to attrition, mm-hmm. and um, I'm also scaling back you know one of the things you have to worry about in uh, any series is the, you know, kind of the lensman effect where things just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger you know before long you're fighting ex- galaxies are exploding and you know the fate of the universe that's his hand uh it's it's a trap you get caught in mm-hmm. and so i've deliberately scaled that back so that you know he's, he's facing asymmetric warfare situations uh he goes off on one mission where it's just dauntless on the mm. mission uh, with no supporting ships uh things like that to try to uh break it up and give a different feel to it right Good. well you get a I, you get a situation in in fiction between you know the, there's batman and he fights guys that are robbing banks and then there's superman and he fights interplanetary invasions and the fate of the mm-hmm. universe hangs in the balance, you know, every issue, right? So you, you have two completely different scales there, yet both are very interesting because of the right. hero, not necessarily, you know, you just need something to challenge that person enough, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the fate of everything hangs in the balance at all times. Right, or, you know, you change the scale of it to make sure it stays human. I, I created a spin-off series called The Lost Stars that goes with Lost Fleet, and it's actually set in a, a syndicate, former syndicate star system that's revolted. And it's kind of a, a fall of, of empire type thing where they're trying to uh, deal with the collapse of the empire and uh, establish themselves as something better. But mm-hmm. the scale of it, of course, because you're dealing with these remnant forces, is it's much smaller. Mm-hmm. So you've got engagements with only a few ships on each side. Uh, you've got more ground engagements. It, it mixes things up quite a bit for me and lets me um, keep things fresh. So when I go back to the Lost Fleet, I've got a you know a little different perspective to go into it with. Mm-hmm. So the Syndicate, they, they struck me as sort of a dystopian uh, fascist corporatocracy, I guess, to mash a bunch of terms together. Um, yeah. Is that kind of what you were going for there? Yeah, or a kleptocracy, you know, they're they're basically the people in charge want all the money and all the power, so they're they've created a system to justify that. Hmm. Did you model that after any particular historical situation or or you just said, Well, this well, is there's been a number of places uh with aspects of that. It's it's kind of a mashup of a number of them. Hmm. Uh, you know, Russia's heading in that direction right now, the kleptocracy. Um, so it's it's kind of a composite, I guess you could say, of a lot of different historical examples. Okay, and uh, there is on the alliance side. Um, I don't I don't know religiously what was going on in the syndicate, but in the alliance there was a lot of talk of of ancestorism, and mm-hmm. you know so so it was. Uh, I I kind of looked at that as as sort of a Romanesque sort of thing where. Whereas a, a lot of people have, have, I would consider making the, the mistake uh, of saying, well, we need a space empire. And the empire that people are familiar with is the Roman Empire. 
So we're going to name our ships like the the Spiculum and the, you know all these all these boldly Roman names, and then the government's going to basically be a Roman forum, and we're going to have a guy that's not named Caesar, and and all that. So, but I I sort of see aspects of different human cultures that are in there, but they're subtly in there. So so it's yeah. like if you know what you're looking for, you see them, but it's not like yeah, you I come know. out and say, oh yes, it's Emperor Titus of the human fleet yeah that's i mean rome you look at the history of rome and uh, they went through just about everything that any society could go through you know the republic and the empire and everything else so you can certainly get a lot out of that uh the ancestor thing i actually got out of um as i was formulating this i'd read some things about the oldest known religious site that had found a place in the middle east and it was an ancestor worship site hmm and I thought it would be interesting to contrast, uh, here's this uh, super high-tech society spanning a big part of the galaxy, and yet their belief system harks back to the oldest form of human belief, you know, mm -hmm. uh, honoring their ancestors and thinking about what their ancestors would want. Uh, I thought that would be an interesting contrast. Yeah. Um, and no, I think it has given me some things to play with. Well, this war went on for how long? Like a hundred years since a Geary. Century. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at that point, um, had they had they not been able to approach each other's worlds and just bomb all the industry off, or or was it a just sort of a, a truce at the border, or was it yeah. a was it a hot war the whole time? Yeah, it was pretty much a hot war the whole time. It's just you're talking about um, societies with such immense wealth, so many star systems, and easy to access all the wealth in space, you know, the metal in the asteroids, everything else. Uh, immensely rich societies by our standards. Uh, they could just keep going for a long time, plus the huge distances involved, the sizes of the populations. Um, essentially, they were too massive to be easily defeated by either side. You know, kind of like invading Russia. You don't want to do that because it's mm. just too darn big. Um, and that's the situation they were in. The syndicate who'd started the war uh, refused to stop it, and the alliance refused to surrender, so it just kept going on. Kind of a World War One type situation. Right, and, and I was thinking about that. Like, the, the worlds on the border would almost be kind of trench warfare, right? Because yeah, they, 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 would, they would have gotten situation. cored out. So, but it, but that doesn't leave a lot of room for ground engagement, though, right? It, so it's oh, it's yeah. just fleet things. Um, well, there, there were a lot of ground engagements. Yeah, I don't because the lost fleet is is focused on the fleet. I don't get into them very much. Uh, that's something that's that's discussed more in the Lost Stars books. But yeah, there were some horrendous big ground actions with uh, um, tremendous numbers of people. Uh, lost in in the engagements as, as you tried to literally seize planets. Hmm. So so was it a situation where both sides had their industry like continuously geared for war for a, a whole century, and they're just constructing ships and shipyards as as fast as they can put them out, and yeah, assembling ships and throwing them at each other. Yeah, a lot of that. And, you know, the big part of the Beyond the Frontier stuff, the stuff that takes place after the war ends, is the shocks to uh, the alliance economy when it ends. And all of a sudden, they've got to figure out, oh, peace. How do we handle that? <clears throat> um, how do we handle um, re, re uh, jiggering our industry and everything else? Mm -hmm. you know, what do we build? How do we do it? Because well, the none of them know, know that. Well, that's kind of a parallel um, to America, World War II, right? Because we had mm -hmm. we had uh, come from a place where we were industrially fairly idle, and then ramped up into this this military industrial production machine, right? Where the entire society was building tanks and planes and bombs, and then the war was suddenly over. Um, but for us, that actually became incredible prosperity following that. You know, like the, the boys came home, they found jobs, but we had to turn the economy. Luckily, we found that Cold War to kind of keep things going. <laughs> but, but it was also a thing of, of uh, 
all of the industry that had been lacking, there was such an influx of money into that that we had, you know, all all the latest factory stuff. And then yeah. it's like, well, we don't need to make tanks anymore. Hey, we can make consumer goods. And then, you know, capitalism got its its great second wind, you know, that, that I think now, uh, of course, we bombed Japan flat, so they had no legacy factory stuff. So they actually got a jump on us in the reconstruction because we went over and we gave them even newer stuff, um, you know, and, the, and then they were able to apply processes that, that were more fit to their society. So um, as, as far as efficiency and, you know, their, their whole Kaizen mentality and, and that. So it, it's, an, it's created kind of an interesting economic situation here on Earth. Um, were you kind of a student of any of that, looking at, well, I'm going to write this book where the war economy now pivots into a civilian state, and, you know, what's the aftershock of that? Yeah, I mean, that was a big part of it. Of course, <clears throat> the driving thing wasn't, um, you know, from the first book of the Lost Fleet, wasn't the economy so much as... Um, <clears throat> When I started the Lost Fleet, we had just started the, the um, what was once called the Global War on Terrorism type thing. And people were talking about this really long war and, you know, this would be going on for decades type thing. And I wanted to explore the impact on the society if you're in a long war. What does that do to your military? What does that do to your gut? Uh, what does it do to the way people think? Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> It has a big effect, you know. Gary comes in there after a hundred years of, of, of all this, and he's he's horrified to see some of the things these people do and just accept because over time they just gradually changed what they what they think is uh, an acceptable tactic, an acceptable thing to do. Hmm. Um, and I saw some aspects of that that I wanted to um, look at, and uh, so yeah, the Lost Fleet deals with that, and and. Uh, the Beyond the Frontier continues it as, as um, the aspects of the alliance that were grown up uh, as part of the long war. I mean, there's some parts of that that does not want to let go of the power they gained mm -hmm. during the long war. So do you, um, have a, do you have a situation then where, hey, the war is over? Oh, yeah, well, we really don't want to get out of the, the, out of the battle cruiser business, so we need to find somewhere else to start sending fleets. Well, there's, <clears throat> there are some factions with that. There's uh, uh, people who think that uh, internal security, you know, they're going to be looking for different enemies to, to hunt now that they uh, supposedly don't have to worry about the others. There's some who, frankly, would rather the war continued on mm -hmm. uh, so that they, it would be a predictable thing for them. Um, there's a lot of disruption going on and a lot of, you know, questioning of, okay, so what is it we're supposed to stand for? And what is it we should be aiming for? And that's been one of the things bedeviling Gary, Gary throughout the series is, uh, you know, why exactly, what role am I supposed to play here aside from just winning victories? I'm, you know, I'm from 100 years ago. People think of me as one of the ancestors, and they think I'm really wise in some things. So what should I be telling them to do? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the next book that comes up, Steadfast, he, uh, he finally figures it out. <laughs> and so... That, that was a nice moment for me to uh, to write the moment when he figures out, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's so yeah, I've, I've, I've factored in the economics and uh, the government stuff and the social stuff because you know it's all tied together. Um, mm -hmm. So so it, do you it's take all part and parcel? Because well, you were saying that as sort of a reflection of the time period of what was going on when, when you began to write the series, right? And and that mm -hmm. colored your telling of the story. So now that you're writing the, the new works uh, and the way that things have changed yet still kind of remain the same, um, it, has that further colored what you're doing or is your fiction separate and, it, and it's got its own life and it's not really influenced by current geopolitics? Well, it's, it still has to grow out of the same thing. You know, I can't do a pivot after, you know, seven or eight books in a series. You can't suddenly change direction wildly without making people say, wait a minute, this isn't the same story anymore. 
Um, so there's that momentum of the storyline. There's there's the way things are, but that continues to feed into um, storylines that have resonance today. Um, for example, one of the things that Gary's been dealing with for uh, quite a while has been the issues of secrecy. What, what is secret and why is it secret? Um, what, what things is the, are the government keeping from the people of the Alliance? Uh, what things should they be keeping from them and what things should they uh, actually be talking about? Mm. Um, so that's been a, uh, an important issue in the last few books, but it's been one that's been there all along. It's probably getting a little more emphasis now, and that's probably a reflection of the, some of the things we're discussing in real life right now. Okay. So have you had any fans of the series submit their own short fiction that that is perhaps in the same universe that you've created, but not necessarily anywhere in view of the characters that you've created? Um, no, not that I have found. Okay. Because um, I, I see that... Uh, you know, as as a source book for hey, here's here's this universe and here's how it works, and and we're all familiar with that. So then, you know, I I could write a story uh, about some James Bond kind of guy that you know mm-hmm. is is like doing something else, right? An espionage thing that's going on in a syndicate world or or whatever. Um, has the temptation ever hit you to to maybe divert over to a couple of short stories about characters that are that are away from this you know where to I don't, I don't know do, do you ever get tired of writing about the same people and and bringing that and it's just like hey i want to talk about somebody's second cousin that you never heard of before and no, just do like something I said, I, something different yeah that's uh, uh, that's why i created the lost stars they're very different people you know they, they were raised to believe in totally different things um uh, some very um, <clears throat> unusual characters. Um, for example, um, Colonel Morgan, she's um, uh, a bit psychotic, and she's uh, very much a secret agent type. <clears throat> um, so it's fun to write about her. It's fun to write about uh, <clears throat> all those people in that environment who have this very different approach to the way they think mm-hmm. um, and yeah that gives me the different perspectives because as you say after a while it does get tired uh, it does get hard to keep coming up with new things um, new situations and uh, so far I've done it um, got one more book contract after Steadfast I don't know I might have to take a break after that because um, I want to make sure I uh, keep it good, and mm-hmm. it's it's um, it's been a challenge. But the Lost Stars has played a big role in keeping it fresh because they're such totally different people and uh, different situations. I can get them involved in. Um, so, um, yeah, the the short answer is yes. I have to okay. do that kind of thing. So and there may be um, some short stories coming up too. Uh, that, that will be canon. Actually, I have written a couple short stories, come to think of it. Um, one was called Grendel, which was uh, about Geary's first battle, uh, the one where he got put into suspended animation, and uh, the other was called Flesh, which was about the battle where uh, Tanya Dejani uh, earned her Alliance fleet cross, the one she never wants to talk about. Hmm. Uh, so I did write those two. Okay. So if you had to step away from science fiction, or, or at least this particular type of science fiction, for for one effort, you know, not not like a series or, or whatever. But it, but if we said, hey, we're going to hire you, and we want you to write some sort of fiction that is, is just not spaceships, like wh- where do you go? What would be your first what pick? A, what a coincidence you should ask me that. <laughs> um, for because I've been working on a series I call Steampunk with Dragons. Um, it's it's science fiction primarily. It's real steam. <laughs> boilers and steam locomotives and stuff and horse cavalry and dragons um and um i finally uh have this series uh has been picked up by audible they're going to be bringing out the audio books uh this fall on um, the first one's called the dragons of Dorcastle. Mm. and uh it's a it's been a fun series to write it's very different uh 
Well, one of the main characters is what's called a mechanic on her world, and she is a uh, basically she's who knows technology and knows mm. how to fix things. Um, to her, her guild, the mechanics control all the technology, which is mostly Steam level. Uh, and then the other character is a mage who um, believes that nothing is real and is able to do things the mechanics can't explain. Uh, and they drive each other crazy because uh, they're both doing things the other think is impossible. Um, but they're a lot of fun together. And um, it's, uh, well, it's an epic series, of course, because she ends up having to uh, um, step into a, a role she's uh, not at all enthusiastic about, sort of saving the day for everyone. That, that but, seems a theme um, in, your, in your work. Yeah, is the reluctant yeah, hero? Reluctant hero, yeah. Right. I, I, I don't like people who want to be heroes. They're they're dangerous for everyone around them. Well, you had that but, guy uh, too, and he was stone cold crazy. The yes. I, I forget his name, but <laughs> you know he was. Yeah. Oh yeah, that guy. <laughs> mm, sorry. Yeah, yeah, they're. Uh, yeah, I do like the to explore the the different aspects of the reluctant hero. I hopefully I don't always make them out the same way uh, in my. Uh, in my Jag in Space series, the reluctant hero was basically just a junior officer who was, who was confronted with um, ethical dilemmas at different points. You know, he, he leads a firefighting team on a, on a ship and somebody gets killed. And then there's a question of, you know, do you ask the questions about how the fire, fights, how the fire started? And uh, do you bring uh, the, the golden boy, Admiral Sun, to court martial on this kind of thing so hmm. you know there's different levels of reluctant heroes from the ones who are going to uh, uh, save dozens of planets to the ones who's going to uh, try to free our world uh, from a, a dominating system to uh, somebody who's just trying to do the right thing uh, within their own little section of uh, of their fleet yeah so uh, since you've you've consumed a lot of science fiction and, and produced some science fiction uh, to, I wanted to ask you about this. So there's there's science fiction for the sake of spaceships and lasers are cool, um, and then there's science fiction for for saying okay we're going to take a very human situation like like what you're talking about there you know the the reluctant hero and and just the aspects of the characters right. So people are people, and they may be in space. They may be you know, in, in uh, like a Viking longboat and not a spaceship, right? But but it's a human situation, right? So y you write books that are more about the character, not so much, look how cool these spaceships are. You know, they, they're a backdrop to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I do try to make it about the people no matter what the situation is because I think the people, no matter how cool you make the, the background, if the people aren't real, if the people aren't memorable, then... Um, well, it's not my kind of story. Um, for example, I wrote one story. Um, it was it was a novella link story called uh, Swords and Saddles, where I had realized there are not many science fiction stories featuring the U.S. Mounted Cavalry, and there are also not many science fiction stories set in Kansas. So I wrote one. Uh, it was kind of a tribute to H. Bean Piper story, where a, a company of U.S. cavalry gets uh, tossed into an alternate universe uh, that's pre-gunpowder, um, and they've got carbines. Um, but that was still, despite all the stuff about the cavalry and everything else, it was still mainly about the captain who's in charge of that force, mm -hmm. trying to uh, look after his, his soldiers and figure out the situation they're in, and uh, the woman who's leading the uh, the forces uh, there in that alternate universe that he allies with um, and they the story hinges on them and what they do and uh, that's that's the way I do things and I think it's uh, I think it makes better stories when it's about the people okay so if you were going to a desert island and you're gonna be there for a year and I say okay you can take one book <laughs> one movie and one video game What's... Okay, let's see. Um, book. I'd, I'd probably bring the collected Shakespeare because it would take forever to get through it. And I've. it's one of those things I've always said, you ought to read all these someday. Uh, and I finally would. Um, 
Let's see, one movie. So it'd have to be a movie I could watch over and over again. Um, maybe Galaxy Quest, because there's so many little things in there that you spot. Oh, yeah, they made fun of that, too. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see, video game. Maybe Civilization. You can play that forever. Yeah. Uh, and that's, yeah, yeah, probably Civilization, just because you can just just keep going with it. You could play that for a year. Yeah. Did you um yeah. did you play Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri? Yeah, it, I did a couple times. Okay. Cuz that that was essentially a uh but you remove yeah, that in, to space, yeah, you know. Fiction. Yeah. Yeah. So so kind of illustrative of of uh, what I was saying about uh, you know, science fiction is is about situations, but it it might be a science fiction situation. It just it constructs the metaphor a little bit better, or or in a in a more uh, attention grabbing way than mm -hmm. that you know. It, but it, but it's still the same situation. You're still playing Civilization. It, it it's just the a, a few of the things are different. You know, um, but yeah, I, I think I I look at uh, at some things like well what, what Lucas did. With Star Wars, which is which is kind of a actually a retelling of um, I forget what the Japanese movie was. It was um, darn. <laughs> I knew it until I said until I wanted to say it. But but anyway, it, it was um, you know it, everything's kind of iterative in in that aspect. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of what what drove the science fiction? thing with you you know what why did you decide okay i'm gonna write science fiction instead of cowboys um i think it's because um i like exploring how people interact with technology but also how no matter how the technology changes the people stay the same hmm. uh the different settings i like being able to i mean i've always liked history um and mythology and the idea of being able to create your own history and mythology right. and a, a present day based on that is uh, is uh, just a lot of fun for me. Yeah. By the way, um, Knack in the chat just corrected me. It's uh it was Hidden Fortress was the Japanese movie that I was talking oh, about Hidden with Fortress. Star Wars. Yeah. yeah. So and it, I, and I find that uh, there's a lot of things, you know, like the old the old Kurosawa movies and these themes yeah. that had had come up um, and that's that's what I find fascinating about. I, I go back to really old movies sometimes, and e even stuff from the 70s and, and 80s. And the 80s was a, a crazy magical time, and I and I think it's partially due because of videotape, because there was there was the movie industry, and then they were really reluctant to embrace VHS because they said, oh well, the VHS is going to impact the movie industry. But what they found out was the movie industry kept its money and VHS was a brand new pile of money and suddenly Hollywood was like money money for everybody come make a movie stick it on VHS right so anything mm -hmm. could get made and there, there's this other podcast that I do where we, where we actually we do that we sit and watch kind of like the worst of the 80s that we can find and and just just to <laughs> prove like anything could get made back then uh, well, like uh, it was actually a 90s movie we, we watched Leprechaun the last time around, Jennifer oh, Aniston's yeah. debut. Uh, another movie that proves anything could get made back then. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I just, uh, I look at the old influences of of stories and that, and you see the same themes kind of come up again and again, whether it was, you know, a high-quality science fiction movie or uh, it's when you had a budget, that was very low and you had a supply of money and you know, you're a guy like Roger Corman and you can make five movies a week and you just throw them against the wall and see what ideas stick. And, <laughs> and I think that that was actually a, a really good phase for creativity because we got to see other than uh, what happened with star Wars, which, which was a, a crazy aberration and, and I think has warped our society. <laughs> <laughs> terribly if we never had star wars and all we had was star trek what's the world like today because mm. star wars the commercial success of that bent everybody to say i gotta make star wars also well yeah and unfortunately a lot of them thought that it meant uh 
if I put a big spaceship on here, I don't have to worry about writing a good story. Uh, that's uh, that's true. And, and there's well, a movie so for that. Those... It's called Star Crash. It was made in Italy. It's got David Hasselhoff with a lightsaber fighting stop motion robots. <laughs> I urge you to seek that out. Uh, <laughs> You're gonna mention that every. Week now, I right? I do. My my goal in life is that everyone will have an opportunity to see Star Crash every, at some time. Everyone needs to see Star Crash. <laughs> yeah, there's some. Yeah, there's some god awful movies out there. One of the things, uh, you know, back in the '70s, early '80s, in the fleet, we would get real to real movies sent out to the ships. That's that's how we would watch movies back then, real to real. Wow. And when we get a really bad one, we we just mix up the reels to try to make it a little more interesting. <laughs> okay, let's put in reel three now instead of reel two. <laughs> maybe this will be more interesting then. We got some really bad films. Yeah. So so where do you hang out um, as far as other science fiction writers? Do you, do you guys all have like a secret clubhouse? And you hang out there, well, there's, and there's, well, there's a um, website uh, sff.net, and a lot of us hang out there. Um, there's a, a, a pro um, group in there where we can talk about stuff, but also a lot of us have uh, um, uh, individual pages and and um, uh, communities. I don't know why I can't remember the word. Um, and then I also, um, there's some time on Facebook, you know, there's a lost fans of lost Fleet page there and we, um, and people, uh, talk about things, exchange things and real world. I like to go to the conventions and sit down with people and just talk fans and writers. Uh, it, it's uh, tremendously recharging in terms of getting ideas and thinking about things. Hmm. Uh, Do they have sci-fi the conventions that are just pure sci-fi convention or is it always themed like oh it's a star trek or star wars or, or you know one of the big hitters uh, or or is it just like here's a bunch of random science fiction convention thing anything goes i don't think there's any pure sf conventions anymore nowadays i think uh you know there's the huge media ones the things like dragon con and comic con uh, and then there's the uh, ones that are more about written stuff, uh, Balticon here or uh, Bubonicon in uh, New Mexico. Um, and those tend to be a mix of science fiction and fantasy. Uh, they have movie sections. They've all got anime because, you know, anime drives so much, mm. uh, as it should, because it's a tremendously inventive field i just love the way they just throw things together and, and see what works like you were well, saying about vhs yeah it, and that was the thing when in the 80s is it's very it's very cheap to test an idea mm -hmm. in, in anime you know it's, it's like and well is i mean it, it's it's man hours they have to draw that stuff but but still as opposed to spinning up a movie production company especially in in the, this day when you're expected that if you're going to get a, a movie brought to the theater, that means that it has to be a prepackaged three movie deal. The, you know, it's guaranteed success, and you're going to clear four hundred million on opening weekend. And I think that just makes yeah. it impossible for anybody to get any fresh air in the room. Well, you're right. It is very hard, and the Japanese certainly uh, they do things that we don't. Um, the Miyazaki film last year, the one from Studio Ghibli, uh, from up on Poppy Hill. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it wasn't science fiction, it wasn't fantasy. It was just set in uh, Yokohama in 1964, uh, dealing with issues of, of the past and the future and the fallout from World War II in Korea, and just a beautiful film, uh, wonderful to watch. And would it have been made in the U.S.? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the so Japanese have a see. the the Japanese have sort of a, a different perspective in the aftermath of World War II than than what we do, and and mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a lot to be learned from that because we were the the victorious, yay, our boys came home and we won and we had a booming economy and you know w w what was bad about it, you know. Uh, in the, of course, it, it was terrible when it went on, but hey, we won and everything's great. Versus with Japan, you know, it, it's like, well, you're sitting in a destroyed country, 
and you have to think about the wisdom of, of like, how did we get into that situation and who thought that was a good idea and how do we pick the pieces up and go on kind of thing. Mm. And yeah, that's, that's a thing I don't see addressed. I, I would like to see that in, in a work of science fiction where, you know, maybe, maybe you're the empire that lost. The good guys mm-hmm. don't always have to win. Un- unfortunately, that seems to be the unwritten rule: is the the good guys win, and then there's there's no hard decisions uh, in the aftermath. Mm-hmm. Um, Except for Firefly. Yeah, Firefly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, if Fox actually, ever yeah. does your if Fox ever does a mini series of the Lost Fleet, they'll probably do the books out of order. Or, you know. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. That's that's the risk you always take. Yeah, the um, I mean, one of the things that with the Japanese with anime, um, I mentioned earlier that that new series which is uh, available in the U.S. now, Girls with Panzer, and it's insane by Western standards because the basic storyline is what we would consider a girls' story. You know, it's about making friends and cooperating and doing things together, um, but. They do it with tanks. Uh, you know, girls' schools compete with each other by crewing actual World War II vintage tanks with teams of girls. And tr- girls. Traditionally, we have not really strengthened our friendship through tank warfare. No. So no, that's no, an no, interesting they, take. They do in this. They do in this. So you've got the tanks, which is a pure, you know, it's, it's actual realistic tactics and everything. It is purely what you would consider a boys' show. And then you've got the the actual storyline, which is the girls' underdog team that has to win by working together and making friends story, uh, you would never see that in the West. You would never see those two elements combined because somebody would say, well, is this aimed at boys or at girls? And the answer would be yes. Yeah. Um, And uh, it's amazing that it works. I was just reading an article about that's the reason why uh, Young Justice was killed because more girls are watching it than boys. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. Absolutely insane. <laughs> Sorry. Because so. they spend a lot of money. They spend just as much money as the guys do. It's 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 purely a matter of you know, self self fulfilling prophecies. Yeah. But the imagination, the ability to look beyond the, um, the boxes, is a very important thing. Yeah. And uh, I I certainly salute anime in terms of being able to do that. Right. Well, um, Knack brings up another thing in, in chat where he's like, you know, about watching uh, Super Dimensional Fortress Macross, Macross, however you pronounce mm. it, Robotech to us here in America. Um, yeah. But it's uh, the whole notion that you can defeat the entire alien empire with a song and a pretty yeah. girl. <laughs> that, that, yes. That's so uniquely. Have you not seen Macross? No. Oh my God! Show's over. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, Minmay. Well, Minmay is this girl, and she sings a song, right? And it's it's like a star search kind of thing, you know. And and she's on, and and they play this for the morale of all the fighter pilots that are out there doing the valiant last stand against the enemy. And they take this this girl who's essentially like Lady Gaga. Right, but a lot more innocent and whatever, and and she sings this song about love and that, and the aliens that they're fighting can understand it. They don't they don't really relate to the concept because they're all genetically engineered, test tube born, fifty foot tall giant men, you know. And the, the the you find out later there are women of the species, but they're continuously in conflict with each other, right? But imagine a bunch of 50-foot-tall Spartans that drive giant robots and have big spaceships, and then they get hit with a love song, and it just melts their brains. And, <laughs> and they're paralyzed with it, and they, they, they just don't know, you know, their, their entire system is destroyed because this love song just, you know, puts a tear in their eye, and they can't process it. And that's how we win. So, spoilers. But, but yeah, and that, but that's a thing, in, you know, that anime will try, and they succeeded uh, amazingly um, with it. But it, but it's a, just so much experimental stuff that comes out, and and I guess that that's the deal is when when Hollywood demands 
you know that that you're gonna you're gonna break records with everything that comes out the gate and they're not uh, they're not willing to take risks on throwaway projects for the fun of the game right then I, I think we get so stifled in creativity that a lot of things just can't get out into the light well, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you there I mean it, it is a, a real problem I mean you can see it with Pixar who came out with some really brilliant innovative products but now they're at the point where you know they come out with a new film and everybody immediately says oh it's not as good as up yeah well you know what is well what um, what's the solution for that do you just tear it down and and start up a you know a new name somewhere where people don't have the expectations and and you start over again and that's how you have your creativity yeah, I think so. Where people, you know, they will uh, go off and do side projects where they can indulge that sort of thing and just just try something new. Right. Um, so, like, if you decide, okay, I'm going to write westerns from now on, and I'm done with sci-fi. <laughs> do you have to change your name again? Because people people pick up a, a Jack Campbell book and they're, and they're like, oh, wait a minute, you know, what's this western thing? And you know, so you know, there's. That's a good question. I mean, traditionally people have done that, but there have been other people who have written a wide variety of things and uh, used the same name. <clears throat> um, so I don't know what the answer would be on that. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how this um, Steampunk with Dragons things goes because it's it's obviously not the same as the other Jack Campbell stuff. Right. I um, think it's pretty good, but it'll, you know, I'll see if the dude will the Jack Campbell people, <clears throat> people who like my stuff, give it a chance or not. Yeah. Or will they say it's something different? I, I, I just want to say I love dragons, like, a lot. So I will... <laughs> the Temeraire... I can have you tell. Read, have you read the Temeraire series of books? Yeah, part I, of it. I, I do love those. And, yes, How to Train Your Dragon, my favorite movie ever. Um, so I'm excited that... I like steampunk, too, so I will definitely read it. And while I've been sitting here <laughs> trying not to cough, I purchased the first book in the um, the new series, the, not the, the Beyond the, oh god um, you know what I'm talking about <laughs> Beyond the Frontier? Yeah um, Dreadnought Yeah So I'm going to start reading that tonight Very Cool. Excited. So John, have you, have you ever read any of Larry Correa's stuff? He did the Monster Hunter International series yeah, yeah, I read one or two of those. Yeah, I I, I thought to read nearly as much as I want to. Yeah, it's uh, I thought that, that was kind of kind of interesting though because he he sort of had a different take on the thing. And uh, Brian, since you're such a fan of of the TV show Supernatural, I think you're you're the target audience for this. Really? So What's it yeah, What's Monster it Hunter here? International. It's a mm -hmm. it, it's sort of a a secret group of monster hunters that are there because of a loophole in in some treaty that was made back in the like revolutionary war days to to uh farm out ghost busting to mercenaries pretty much because <laughs> the government didn't want to own that um it, it, it's kind of interesting and the, the guy that wrote the thing he's a gun store owner and He's he's very very into his firearms, right? The the books actually kind of they they border on gun porn at some points, um, but but it, it's kind of like well I dreamed up this really cool gun now I got to put my hero in a situation where he gets to kill stuff with it, you know? But it but it's also he uh, he does things like uh, where a team of Navy SEALs takes down a uh, a uh, oil tanker that's infested with vampires, right? So you have like your tactical room sweeping thing, you know, that a SEAL team would do, and then it also happens to be like stake in vampires. So it, it's it's very interesting, but it, it, it's just a thing of you know t talking about like branching out into into other things. It just reminded me of his books, especially with like the steampunk thing and that. But there but there was there was one scene I I, I have to kind of spoil. Where they they talk about they're gonna go to the uh, to the enchanted garden or the enchanted forest. I think uh, yeah, I think it was enchanted forest to meet the queen of the elves. Right. So they all get in the Winnebago and they drive out into the heart of of like Mississippi swamp area, and 
there is a mobile home park called the Enchanted Forest, and there there are a bunch of like redneck elves <laughs> that live out there, yeah. and yeah, it's it's great. the the, the book The book takes uh, like traditional tropes about fantasy writing and kind of stands them on their head every now and then. It's pretty hilarious. But anyway, that's that's my plug for his book. He'll never listen to the show. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's kind of getting late. We should wrap this up. I'm I'm not doing so well. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, you but sound like you're gonna point. die over there. You're coughing. And... Uh, I'm coming down with something. I, I this this is what happens when you date a teacher who deals with petri dishes all day. Yeah. Um, or children, as most people. Call yes, them. yes. Schools <laughs> schools are plague zones. Yeah. <laughs> The, the the black death. Yeah. Um, hey, did you hear the news about the black death? By the way, they they uncovered some graves mm -hmm. in London, and they found out that the black death. We've always thought that it was because of fleas that were on the rats, but then they said, "Oh no, that now we've got evidence that it was actually an airborne plague, because it couldn't have done the things that it did given a, a rat infection vector." Oh my God. So, yeah, so it, it, it's kind of interesting. I'm kind of hopeful that when they dig all these plague bodies up that they don't, like, stir that back up into the air. That would, that would be a little unfortunate, but, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's still out there. I mean, it's uh, there's a lot of it down in the American Southwest, in the, the underground rodent colonies. Bubonic plague, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, w I wasn't aware that we still had it creeping around. Oh. Hey, that's oh, another it's... reason to stay out of Texas. Between That's... that and that, that super virus they uncovered in Antarctica or whatever that was, yeah, we're we're in for some fun time. Yeah. Oh, they were they were there was talk about like the uh, speaking of history and that, um so the Spanish flu, which killed mm -hmm. basically everybody in Europe, um uh, so they were there was some speculation about well what if we found somebody that was a Spanish flu victim that was frozen, right? The, the, you know now that now that all the permafrost is melting and that you know what what if we found somebody from that time that got frozen because of exposure and has remained frozen all this time and they thaw out and somebody finds him now now we have that virus live again because you know that, like nobody knows what it was yeah that's that that was fascinating I actually did a time travel story on it because it's so it was so unusual. Unlike a typical flu, it killed mostly healthy young adults because it attacked the immune, caused the immune system to overreact. So the healthier you were, the more likely you were to die. Uh, and once it had gone swath through and killed so many millions of people, it disappeared. So, yeah, very weird. Yeah, pretty strange stuff. But that, but that's what makes me nervous about, you know, when the when they're down in like the forests in Brazil, right? And they're and they're plowing like untouched virgin mm -hmm. territory to to harvest all these trees and stuff and people talk about like they had uh, that one movie where they were talking about well maybe the cure for cancer was down there you know and, and we just like killed whatever had it you know but it's so many of our medicines come from these discoveries and that so but uh, but i was thinking about well what about like all the new viruses that you're turning over <laughs> you know like things that humans have not been exposed to before ever and then we're going into these new places, and yeah, so it was like it was like that Sean Connery movie where he found the cure for cancer in the it, rainforest. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, I can't Medicine remember Man. the name of it. Medicine Man. Medicine Man. All right, but once again, it... Sean Connery can always be counted on to save the day. <laughs> Crazy ass ponytail. I remember yes. that movie. <laughs> <laughs> have you Have you ever seen Zardoz? Oh, I love oh, that. Oh God, movie. <laughs> I love that movie. They had a nice little homage to that in Community recently. Oh, really? Is, oh, it was great. <laughs> I have to it look was, that up. You will. It's the Meow Meow Beans episode. If that oh, helps. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, well, I'll, I'll let you guys get. John, thank you so much for joining us and taking time out of your uh, your evening. To well, uh, Thanks for uh, listening to me, letting me ramble on. And I'm sorry, like I said, I didn't talk much. I would have if I was healthy, but... Uh, yeah, and if you could send us, is there any sort of a press kit 
or whatever for the new book that's coming out that'll give us some idea of like when it's going to hit the street and and that and then we'll we'll pass that info along in the post um okay yeah i'll uh i'll have uh the publisher send you something um it's coming out on the 4th of may steadfast so. okay that's coming up pretty uh, quick then we, so we could still put it, we'll put it in the show notes yeah yeah have them send me whatever they have okay sure well thanks Awesome. Of course, that's kind of what we do. That's one of the reasons we do this, <laughs> is to promote people. Um, but yeah, we love your books, folks. If you haven't read them and you like space combat, and I have a feeling <clears throat> you do because you're listening to us, um, the Lost Fleet series. What was the first one again? Oh, God. Uh, Dauntless. Dauntless. Yeah. Dauntless is the first one. Check it out. It's excellent. And the space combat is just really, like, I've read a lot of sci-fi, and yeah, I haven't, I, it's nothing else like it. Yeah, did, did you, was there any confusion with oh. the readers about the order to read the books in? Because, you know, like, if you come to it late, it's like, well, here's six books, and they're all named after ships, but it's not like Lost Fleet 1, 2, 3. You know, so. Yeah, there, there, there is occasionally people asking me, you know, what order should it be read in? For some reason, only the French and the Japanese actually number them. Wow. Nobody yeah. else does. So, I don't know why that is. All they have to do is look up your Wikipedia page. It's all yeah. like right there. But, but I deliberately try to write them so if somebody picks up, you know, the third book in the series or something instead of the first, they can yeah. catch up and figure out what's going on. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Totally. Totally, which is which is common in a lot of series. A lot of like like one of my favorite series is uh, the Dresden Files. Mm -hmm. Every book has a bit of that. So yeah, that's that seems common. But you got to because someone might jump in in book four, or book twelve, right. or whatever. Yes. Yeah, with the Dresden Files. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, man. Well, folks, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions or comments about this podcast, feel free to leave them below or contact us at. Oh my god. Hail, I can talk. Hail at spacegamejunkie.com. God damn it. Uh, Jim, thanks as always for. Remember when we first started this podcast and I was sick and you, like, you had, we had Chris Roberts on and you, like, asked everything because I couldn't talk? Yeah. <laughs> kind of like, kind of like that. So I appreciate you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, John, if, if, uh, if you want to listen to it, it was the fourth episode of the show. We can send you a link to it when we had Chris Roberts on, okay. and sure. that kind of closes the loop on your Wing Commander connection, right? But I, uh, yes. I talked to him because have you seen the Wing Commander movie? Yes. Okay, <laughs> that that's all you need to say. I, I know the rest, <laughs> right? But we asked him, you know, or I asked him. I, I was just like, well, Chris, I, I have to know, you know, like what's the story? What what happened with that movie? And I was just expecting him to, to kind of be like, well, you know, stuff happens, whatever. And, uh, but he went on like, oh, gosh, what was it, like an hour-long deep dive into, into <laughs> how Fox did him wrong? And <laughs> it, was, it was quite amazing. Yeah, yeah, so, he seemed to have a lot of regret. <laughs> yeah, he, well, he, had, yeah, he had some war stories about that movie. And, but you know what, what's interesting, too, is he also did that movie. Um, it was like a retelling of Beowulf. Uh, it was um, darn. What was that thing called? It was uh, oh, the uh, the the guy comes down from space. Uh, Outlander? Outlander. Yeah, it was yeah, Outlander. Yeah. When and I, I had never made the connection that that was the same guy. I didn't either. And that's a great movie. Yeah, I I thoroughly enjoyed that. You know, the the guy crash lands from space amid the Vikings, and he happens to have a dragon on his ship, and. Uh, uh, kind of neat one of one of the more that that's a like what we were talking about is when you get the the license to just create a one-off story of something crazy and it works yeah you know where, where he, he didn't have to guarantee anybody he was going to make 300 million dollars opening weekend with that and we got something really good out of it and then with wing commander i think there were some guarantees made and we know what happened so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, well, again, um, thank, thanks, folks. <laughs> we'll end on that. Have a good night. All right. Oh my god. And and thanks for stopping by, John. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I guess I'll head off to you then. All right. Take you don't these. have to. Well, yeah, you, you can hang to. out. I'll. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just so. stop the recording and the stream. I think Brian's. Uh...
Yeah, I need to, I need to take some Nyquil and 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 knock myself the the, the hell out. I'm sorry. I <laughs> Oh my god. I'm I'm really sorry. I feel like I've been rude.